Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Dark Parade. I, as ever, am your host, Bo, and we are in the midst of our listener request season. That means all of the movies that we are covering in February are movies that you, the kind listener, have selected uh, via either the Facebook group, which is, of course, uh, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash dark parade. Or you've hit me up on Twitter uh, at Dark Parade Pod and said, hey, here's a movie you ought to cover. And then uh, we did. Um, so, first of all, thank you for submitting your request. Uh, this request came from the guy who was also on the episode, uh, a familiar voice here on the Dark Parade, Derek Bourgeois, who decided that uh, we needed to talk about the Charles Norris action film, uh, Silent Rage on account of there being kind of a Frankenstein's monster in it. We'll get to all that in a minute, but uh, yeah. So thanks very much for uh, contributing um, to this season. It means a lot. I have long wanted to make sure that this show was somewhat interactive and that these episodes hopefully start a bit of a conversation about the movies instead of just end one. So uh, feel free to hit me at uh, either Facebook or Twitter, or if you don't use either of those things and still want to drop me a line, you can do so at bo, B-O at legionpodcasts.com, and I will get back to you uh, in one form or another. So, uh, with all that uh, housekeeping out of the way, let us waste no more time, and let's get to this discussion about the weirdo action movie horror film science fiction hybrid that is Silent Rage. Take it away, me and Derek. <laughs> All right, folks, as promised, here is uh, the one, the only, Derek Bourgeois. Welcome to uh, Fight Night here on the Dark Parade. <laughs> uh, oh. Yeah, so, all right, Derek, first of all, this was your pick. Yes. So it was. it's only right that I've, I pulled you on the show to explain yourself. As you may or may not know, I am not uh, what you would call a connoisseur of the work of one um, Charles Norris. Yep. I, I have only seen a handful of uh, his films, um, mostly missing in action two, weirdly, more so than the first or the third. And also I've seen uh, Invasion USA a couple of times now, which I enjoy, but not because of Chuck Norris. Yeah. It, it's really the, the Richard Lynch show, as far as I'm concerned, and just crazy stunts and shit like that. But so this is, first of all, let me just ask you, since it was your pick, why on earth uh, would you pick this uh, movie for me, knowing full well that I am not what you would call a particular fan of Chuck Norris? Because I was actually listening to your uh, pick six movies and you said you didn't see this movie. That's true. I, so I was like, hmm, you know what? Let me just throw it into the web of things because, you know, it's a movie that I actually, it took me a while to see Silent Rage because I didn't even know this movie actually really existed. Yeah. And until uh, I seen a little movie called Hot Fuzz. You're right, where, right. Where, where Simon Pegg and Nick Frost's characters actually rented this movie like one night and like made it part of like their double feature of bad boys two and silent rage and uh i actually remember listening back to the com it was actually one of the first commentaries i ever listened to was of edgar wright and quentin tarantino and they're like talking about this movie it's, it's fucking chuck norris versus michael myers <laughs> you know like, yeah that's not wrong yeah so it was like you know, at the time when I first heard of it, I'm like, oh, shit. Because I, I was a kind of a bigger Halloween fan than I was now because I kind of outgrew those movies. But uh, this one's fucking, like, besides Chuck Norris, I'm, like, looking at, like, the rest of the cast. I'm like, fucking Ron Silver, fucking Stephen Keats, fucking William Finley. 
and uh, Steven fucking flounder first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, so I was like, this is a weird odd podge cast of characters surrounding Chuck Norris. And then, you know, uh, later on in life, uh, actually, the killer of this movie, played by Brian Libby, uh, they actually uh, actually talked a shitload about him during the commentary too of Hot Fuzz for some weird reason. Where he's like, yeah, he went on to be like a Frank Darabont staple because he's in every Frank Darabont movie. I did not realize that. Uh, he he plays like one of the cops that arrest John Coffee in the Green Mile. I think he's a judge in the Shawshank. Uh, he he his he's actually his most iconic role for me is in your favorite horror movie of the two thousands, The Mist, where he plays the biker who goes out in the mist with the rope attached to him. Right, right, right. And he comes back half of a guy. <laughs> but yeah, uh, I, I had no idea that was him. But great, great. Yeah, so I, I learned a lot of about other movies with this movie which is crazy and weird at the same time overall the the story is fucking out there and you know it's kind of crazy and you know Chuck the thing that's weird about this is you know when I was watching it you know it's it's still like young before he's like fucking canon Chuck Norris to this movie you know you know I kind of prefer some of his earlier roles to like some of his fucking later day like 80 shit even though i still like some of those movies they're fun don't get me wrong you know they actually had kind of more interesting storylines like with men that wear sunglasses which is actually kind of like a fucking giallo <laughs> it's fucking weird this is a giallo movie with chuck <laughs> yes yeah, so have you seen hero and the terror yeah that one's pretty good is that similar to this kind of because that sounded like, you know, once again, Chuck Norris squares off against, you know, some unstoppable killing machine that has a slightly supernatural and or fantastic bent. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. There's a few of them. Like, there's a, f- a lot of, like, his earlier movies, like the, the one and, like, this or, like, murder mystery movies and shit. It's weird. Yeah. I, all right. Well, let's... And let's dig into this thing. So, as uh, per usual, we uh, like to uh, begin with a look at, at the plot, uh, wander our way through uh, the story of this thing. And it starts off with Brian Libby as in a sensitive portrayal of mental illness being sweaty as hell and i guess he's renting a room at this place is the idea i think so yeah uh, where uh, a a family has just allowed this crazy person to live in their guest room for a while or something and he calls his doctor to, to his credit he calls his doctor is like i'm really losing it man i'm losing my I'm shit losing it, doc come on <laughs> and, and... Honestly, we find out that his daughter is Ron Silver. He's like, <laughs> he's fucking losing. I, I, honestly, with this fucking people that he's living with, I probably would have fucking lost it. Too. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a straight up family. This isn't just like, well, here's an elderly couple that's turning their place into a and b or something. It's like there are a couple of kids running around in the yard. And, and that, I mean, not the kind of situation where you want a mentally unstable individual. And yet he is. And so after talking to his doctor, he then goes to half-heartedly chop up some wood, which it just gives him an excuse to have an ax. And I, and at this point I was like, well, you've got my attention, silent rage. You have a, a, a crazy person with an ax and that ain't nothing. And, uh, sure enough, he loses his nut, starts hacking up the family. Um, the mother screams to get the attention of the mailman, who, as we all know, is the most efficient of government service officials. 
and the the mailman is like, "All right, I'll get the help, the authorities." And so the mailman runs off, and he ends up killing the husband and the wife. And that's when the police show up in the form of Dan Stevens, uh, who who is Charles Norris in this movie, and his deputy Charlie, as played by Stephen First. And it's, you know, it's it's Chuck Norris kind of creeping around the house looking for this guy. A little bit of fighting. They run outside. Um, I do like the fact that they arrest this guy by braining him in the skull with a two-by-four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it, it's nice to see that police work hasn't really changed all that much. And, yeah, so they just knock this guy in the skull with this two-by-four. He ends up coming to, though, and breaking out of his handcuffs. And then he grabs a shotgun from one of the other cops. And then they just lay waste to this dude and shoot him about 57 times. Oh, I, I love it, too, because fucking Ron Silver ends up coming. And he's like, I'm his doctor. And all of a sudden, it's like the slow-mo happens. <laughs> Slow mo Ron Silver, which is always great. Yeah, and let me yeah. say something about slow mo Ron Silver in this. He's got quite a mane of hair. Yeah, and every when it goes to slow mo and he's doing the no, that hair is glorious as it bounces uh, in, in slow motion. I think maybe it's just because I'm getting more and more bald by the day, and every time I see good hair like this, I'm like, son of a bitch, those were the days. I never I had hair like there. that, even in my prime, but Same. I was, yeah, I was, <laughs> I respect the game that Ron Silver, Ron Silver has in this movie. Um, yeah. So they take this John Kirby dude to an institute where everything is apparently, um, because not only is it the place where they're going to conduct their, you know, Dr. Frankenstein like experiments on this dude, but Chuck Norris is like getting checked out from a, bum elbow and you know it's not since science crazed has one building done more but oh, uh, boy. <laughs> we'll get to that next week but uh, yeah so he's taken to the, the this institute where uh, his, his doctor Ron Silver is working alongside this guy named Dr. Spires and another doctor named Vaughn and Spires is kind of the Dr. Frankenstein yeah, yeah, Stephen Key, too. Uh, most of the listeners would probably know is the son-in-law from Death Wish that keeps calling fucking Charles Bronson dad. Dad! Yeah. What are you doing, dad? Fucking, oh, I wanted to kill him in that movie. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's good stuff. And William Finley, of course, Phantom of the Paradise mm -hmm. himself. And these guys are kind of huddled around the body, and they're like, this guy's dead. He is, this is as dead as you can get without... Uh, being completely dead. Um, but while that's going on, Chuck Norris is getting his ribs checked also, which allows him to take off his shirt and give a little something to the ladies. Oh, yeah. And and he's got a hairy chest, too, which is another thing I really respect. He's like a, a quality hairy chest, you know? Um, at any rate. So he's uh, shirtless, chatting it up with uh, the doctors, while meanwhile... Our, our team of, of geneticists uh, who are looking at John Kirby, uh, Dr. Uh, the, the Dr. Philip, what, what's his name? Spires, is yeah. like, hey, I got this reanimator juice. How about I pump this dude full of that? And it'll, you know, enhance his cellular strength and he'll regenerate and all kinds of crazy shit. And Ron Silver rightly is like, hey, hey, hey. Look, first of all, you're talking about jumping into human experimentation on this trial formula, and we don't know what that's going to do to him. Second of all, look at his brainwaves. This is a crazy person. You can tell by his brainwaves, and we don't know what this formula would do to somebody who's already mentally imbalanced, so knock the shit off. Yeah. And Dr. Spires is like, you're right, you're right. You know, I when you say it out loud like that, it's totally crazy. I'm absolutely not going to do this. And, until when Mother leaves the room. <laughs> right, until Rod Silver is like, all right, well, I'm going to go 
uh, get some coffee and maybe play some golf or something. Glad that we got that out of the way. And as soon as he walks out the door, they're like, we're totally going to give this guy the secret formula. Fuck that, dude. Let's give him this formula now. Right, which they do. And so after shooting him up with their, you know, reanimator juice, we we cut over to Chuck Norris for a bit because he's chatting it up with uh, this lady friend of his that they... It turns out they dated like six years ago, I think is is where they land with this. Yeah. And um he's it turns out Ron Silver is the brother of this lady, Allison. And uh he's like, Wait, do am I missing something here? Do you guys know each other? And she's like, Yeah, we dated for a while and he's like, Well, how come I didn't know about that? She's like, I don't Yeah, he yeah, he's the gray line. Why is Big Brother the last one to know? Right. It's just, I'm not going to tell my brother everybody that I fuck. That's crazy. Uh, um, so, anyway. Uh, also, uh, Allison gives Chuck Norris a, a smack for good measure. She um, does. You know. Because that's where we're starting with this thing. And then, anyway, John Kirby officially dies on the table, but then is reborn as his heart stops and then and then comes back again and Ron Silver walks in on this and it's like look I told you his EEG has crazy brain stuff and uh, you know Dr. Spires once more is like hey we're gonna let this dude die in peace but sure enough he, he injects more of the reanimator juice in the guy as soon as uh, like Ron Silver leaves again like every time Ron Silver leaves the room they're just jamming uh, hypodermics in this dude yeah and so Ron Silver goes out to Chuck Norris and tells him like hey this guy is officially dead and so you can go on home and, and he does uh, but not before Chuck Norris gets a ride with the sister um, and, and immediately after getting smacked just starts getting handsy and flirty with her in the car but she seems to be there for it so what are you gonna do you know yeah, he pulls his Tom Atkins card. Yeah, it's. Uh, I would argue Tom Atkins is a lot smoother because Chuck Norris is like, you know, hey, how about we talk about the good times and I just rest my hand on your thigh. Won't that be a hoot? And she's like, eh, I mean, I guess any port in a storm. Uh, but anyway, so after they flirt and she drops him off at the police station or whatever, um, we cut to Stephen first who uh in a good old fashioned 80s fat joke scene is ordering two plates of food while a bunch of thugs make fun of him for being a big fatty fat fat yeah and Chuck Norris wanders in and one of the thugs gets a little mouthy about like you know I guess I was right all the police in these little towns are chicken shit and uh and so charles norris is like well perhaps i can teach you a little bit of a lesson about what kind of police are here in this town and he choke slams them a little bit and sends them packing and uh and there there's a moment he has with stephen first like he and stephen first are, are kind of buddies in this movie not just you know partners on the force or whatever um, and Stephen First is having like this crisis of conscience about shooting that dude, and Chuck Norris is like, "Don't worry about it. You had to do it. He was a monster with a shotgun." And uh, anyway, back at the institute, Ron Silver gets a gander at the the body of John Kirby, who is now healing like Wolverine. And yep. like all his wounds are, are sealing up all fancy style. And uh, so we we are now kind of on our way with that story. All of this for my money takes way too long to get going because there's a lot of build up to John Kirby being on the loose and, and creating mayhem. There's a lot of this back and forth shit with him just being in the Institute and like, oh, he's dead. Now he's alive. Now we're going to inject him. Oh, look, he's got healing powers. But it's, we're, we're getting to it. 
Yeah, yeah, I, I agree on like this rewatch. I thought it was a little bit more slower than I thought it was in the past. I kind of agree. Like some of the scenes, like it kept going back and forth to you see this lit, watching this fucking dude in the bed. <laughs> you know? Yeah, right. A lot of it is just him taking a nap. And then there's this crazy scene, man, where, and apparently it's something that Stephen First had uh, had, had improv. But it's Chuck Norris and Stephen First in his truck, in his first truck, mm -hmm. and he's talking about cleaning this dog in a toilet that he had when he was a kid, and trying to figure out how to dry it, and he was like, well, I didn't want to put it in the microwave because that might hurt it, so instead, <laughs> I just put it in the deep freezer, and you're like, and you didn't think that would hurt the dog? And he's like, and then I started playing and I forgot about it. And then my mom comes home and surprise, surprise, she pulls out this completely frozen dog. And I always felt kind of bad about that. It's like, well, of course you did. You murdered a dog. Uh, uh, yeah, I honestly like this need a lot of this because Chuck Norris is like, what the fuck? Well, and, yeah. he, he, he actually emotes in it kind of in that scene. <laughs> well, I, this flight. I think it's because it is an improv scene, and so you get a genuine reaction out of him where he's just like, huh, that's real fucked up, Stephen First. I wish you hadn't told me that because now I can't ever look at you in the eye again. Yeah. <laughs> like, it makes Stephen First a really terrible person, in my estimation. And, and so when you get to the end, spoilers, when you get to the end of this and he gets mortally wounded... You're like, well, good. You killed a dog, you son of a bitch. Like, you you were asking for this all your life. You are about to grab that biker lady's tits. Yeah, yeah. All right, <laughs> speaking of. So, it turns out the local bar has now been infested with all these thugs that we saw earlier. And so, Chuck Norris is like, hey, Stephen First, stop the car. I think it's time we went in this bar and took care of some business. And... So they go inside, and it's kind of the centerpiece karate scene. Like, you need Chuck Norris doing karate shit. And that's what happens here. He karates everybody. Um, although, I will say, like, all most of it's... Most of it's fine. There's some good, like, choreography with him kicking the shit out of people. That's all fine. The best stunt is when a motorcycle comes flying out of the bar window. Yeah. That was pretty sweet. Uh, so, I, like, I like the main the main bit, like biker dude that's just screaming in the background. Come on, somebody jump on him, man! Yeah, but you know, I mean, it, it it's much like the scene from Cannonball Run, where everybody fights in the bar before they realize that the roads open again. Yeah, except with only one hero being Chuck Norris, and like Stephen First ain't gonna do nothing here. Um, and there's some, like, again, not to sell the movie short, there's some good stuff with Chuck Norris, you know, karate people. But also, it's just like, what what movie are we in? Like, all the, the, the tone of this movie is so all over the place. Because... Yeah, especially when you're cutting away from, like, the fucking, the fight scene you have Stephen First, like, on the intercom. Like, I'm in love with this girl that I just met. Yeah, or and also you're doing Frankenstein shit back at the Institute, and then we got to pause, not just for this bar fight, which is, is, again, kind of weird and atonal, but then the very next scene is him getting back together with, with Allison, and there is this musical interlude that is very reminiscent of the raindrops keep falling on my head scene from Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Where it's just, it's just them like going on picnics and doing laundry and shit. And you're like, what? what is happening in this movie? How long is it and do we need this scene? Yeah, like when I was starting to rewind, I'm like, I don't remember this movie being an hour and 40 minutes. Did I watch a cut version originally? Like, what the fuck? I mean, you cut out just this musical interlude and you're saving yourself a solid seven minutes that don't mean, mean nothing in the rest of the movie. Because it doesn't yeah. matter. Like, I mean, other than the fact that he he is in love with Allison and when she is in danger, you know, he springs into action. But other than that, like, you can establish that in two minutes and not have a, a song at the center of this. 
but whatever. Anyway, so finally, after an hour of all of this business, John Kirby comes to in in the hospital now, you know, with his X Factor healing abilities, and he escapes from the institute goes to Ron Silver because apparently he had overheard earlier like you know Ron Silver saying you gotta let this guy die he's got all the crazies in his head and I don't think he should be immortal and so he goes to this dude's house and uh, straight up like murders him kills his wife Nancy uh, and it in fairness, this whole sequence is pretty good. It doesn't feel like it's the same movie as everything else because it just becomes... Yeah, because it just turns to a slasher movie. <laughs> Absolutely. And I know the director said, like, well, I'd, I never really watched slasher movies. And I'm like, eh, maybe so, but that's what you made. At least for parts yeah. of it. And, like, that's all of this business with John Kirby killing Ron Silver and his wife is intercut with Chuck Norris who is hanging out with Allison and is like invites her on this like getaway. Like, Hey, let's get out of town. Things have been kind of crazy here recently. And so he's trying to make time with this dude's sister while he's being horribly murdered by being thrown down like three flights of steps. And anyway, so Chuck Norris bounces. Allison shows up at this house to, like pick up some uh like luggage or something for this trip that she and and chuck norris have decided to go on and then it's the laurie strode scene from halloween where she goes into the house and discovers all the bodies yeah i remember the first time i fucking seen this and then i kind of like you know fucking not you know i was paying attention because you know maybe the love shit was like uh, time to read a book for a second <laughs> and I look up and I see De Dead Ron Silver's fucking expression. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah, they <laughs> kind of get Absolutely. The best part of, of this whole sequence is the fact that Ron Silver makes a terrific corpse hanging from this door. It's genuinely disturbing. And in theory, John Kirby is going to kill Allison, but then takes off because um, the cops show up in the form of Stephen First and Chuck Norris. And so after discovering all these bodies, they take Allison back to this institute. But little do they know, Derek, that John Kirby has also returned to the institute. And there he finds Dr. Spires, his creator. And uh, Dr. Spires is like, oh, man, um, uh, you hang out here with the other doctor, with the Phantom of the Paradise. <laughs> and I'm going to go kind of run some interference with Chuck Norris, who is also here. So he takes off, and the the Phantom of the Paradise is like, man, this is a terrible idea. This, th Like, we have created a murderer, and we need to stop this thing. And so he he's going to give him another injection, which Dr. Spires was like, hey, give him another injection to heal all his wounds. But the Phantom of the Paradise instead injects him with some acid. In theory, you know, melting his heart or, or whatever. But it doesn't kill John Kirby because he's now an unstoppable monster. And instead, John Kirby stabs this dude with the hypodermic meant for him. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the fam of the paradise is now dead. And Dr. Spires comes back, finds his dead partner, and is like, oh boy. Um, all right, John Kirby, let me, let me just say this. Um, you're a big success. Good job on not dying and being uh, an unstoppable killing machine. Just remember who it was that saved your life. This guy. And so it's a whole like Frankenstein meeting his creation where, you know, he does everything but the, uh, uh, the shit, uh, 
Gene Wilder, like, hey, handsome. Yeah. And anyway, John Kirby, not impressed by the, the song and dance that Dr. Spires has given him and just snaps his neck. Yeah. So um, now uh, everyone at the Institute who was a doctor is now dead. Um, and then Charlie, like Dan takes off to go to the County coroners for some reason, leaving Stephen first with Allison. And they come across John Kirby, just killing a random employee of this Institute. And Stephen first like pulls his gun and gives it a real, like, um, you're under arrest, sir. <laughs> <laughs> and, John Kirby kind of cubs for him, grabs him, and and picks him up and breaks his back. Allison runs off. Uh, and at this point, Chuck Norris shows back up to the Institute in time to find his dog-killing partner dying. And yeah. kind of dies in his arms. And it's a... Man, again, you're just asking too much of Chuck Norris here when he's, like, holding Stephen first in his arms and is like... It's going to be okay, pal. It's going to be okay. And of course it's not. He dies. Um, yeah. But uh, then at, at the very least, we have whittled the movie down now to the primary elements, which is Chuck Norris, the lady he's trying to protect, and this unstoppable killing machine, John Kirby. And... In a, now it's like, time for that. It's time for that tagline. The fucking payoff. Science created him. Now Chuck Norris must destroy him. Yeah. Speaking of, of, uh, there. Hold on. What is the whole thing? He's an indestructible man fused with powers beyond comprehension. An unstoppable terror who, in one final showdown, will push Chuck Norris to his limits and beyond. Um, which sounds good. Not really what happens in the movie, but it sounds good. It's a good way to sell it, for sure. Sure, sure. <laughs> it's a pretty good poster. Um, but yeah, so he, much like Dr. Loomis, uh, Chuck Norris shoots John Kirby until he falls out of a window. But uh, then um, he comes to, and they start tussling they're doing a bunch of fighting john kirby can't be hurt and is beating the ever-living shit out of chuck norris and then um allison shows up i think she shows up with the car and chuck norris is like get over let me drive and um uh, then john kirby clings to the truck and they basically uh, like with John Kirby hanging on to the, the truck, get it up to speed and then bail on it so that it will crash into a tree and explode. Thereby, in theory, killing John Kirby with the explosion of this truck. Yeah, that doesn't really work out. Right, he just gets back up again because, again, he's an unstoppable killing machine. And so John Kirby just like comes out of the fire like the Terminator. And uh he and he also jumps into a lake and to his credit, jumps into a lake to be like, Oh, I'm on fire. And then you get like some more mono e mono fighting where Chuck Norris is using his patented high kicks and round kicks. To, yeah. <laughs> to just kick this dude in the face over and over again. Uh, he gives him like a giant flying kick into the well. <laughs> yeah, knocks him into a well like Sadako. And, the end. <laughs> right, and then that's it. Like, he leaves. Or, like, they all take off. Like, you know, boy, I'm sure glad that there's no way out of that well. And he is for sure dead now. And so they just walk off, and the last shot of the movie is naturally John Kirby kind of coming to and doing one last jump scare in the water. Yeah. And that's and it. The, the, yeah, and then the, the lead scene is him playing cards with Sadako and the Leprechaun. <laughs> right. Um, all right. 
So that is the ins and outs of, of what goes on in the movie. Again, we didn't go exactly scene by scene, but you get it. You understand what this movie is. Um, so, which brings us to phase two of the Dark Parade, which is the cast. And here, this is a real mixed bag because, again, I think you're asking too much of Chuck Norris in this movie to, to hit these emotional beats, both with Allison and especially in a fairly awkward love scene that mm -hmm. is less erotic than it is just like, oh, I bet everybody on the crew was uncomfortable this day. Um, but Ron Silver is really good. Like, Ron Silver is just a good actor. And he's really good in this. Uh, Stephen Keats is really good in this. William Finley is really good in this. Even Brian Libby kind of has this crazy dark energy. And Stephen first, although, you know, he reveals himself to be a monster with that puppy story, is pretty good as well. So, it like, it's got a surprisingly deep bench of actors, I think, but... I mean, any anybody you want to shout out, or do you have any thoughts on the performances supporting this movie? I actually, you know, like Chuck Norris. And I think they put a lot of like they put a lot of other actors around him to make it more watchable in that sense. Where you know, like him and Stephen First's characters, like interactions, I do like. I do like those in these. Brian Levy is just a force of nature, though. I love like how he emotes, where he's usually silent for most of the movie, with just his eyes. Mm -hmm. That's how you recognize him as an actor, is his eyes and that stare, you know? For sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think he's good in it. I think really everybody but Chuck Norris is good in this movie. And, like, I understand he's the action hero and, and he's the guy who can do the roundhouse kicks. But yeah. it's hard not to think of, you know, like a Michael Bean or something in The Terminator who's not really an action hero, but he's just a good actor. Yeah. And, and so, because there's, you know, in addition to it being kind of a slasher movie, there is that kind of Terminator element of, you know, all, all this thing does is, is kill uh, and come after you and it, it will continue to come after you even no matter how many times you try to kill it. Um but yeah, I think like Chuck Norris is the anchor that weighs the movie down in a lot of the scenes. And if the movie just had more action, you could get away with it. But there's way too much of this, him hanging out with Allison and, and doing these buddy moments with Stephen first that I don't think work nearly as well. Yeah. But then I think to myself, what would this movie be if Steven Seagal was in it? And then I'm like, yeah. yeah, I mean, but I, I, yeah, that you're you're not trading up there, but I'm trying to think, like you need somebody charismatic, like Bruce Lee was charismatic, or even like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I guess is is really the the gold standard where he's yeah, not really a good actor, but he's he's got such presence. Yeah, to be fair, though, Arnold was still like Conan at this time when this movie came out, mm. so yeah. Yeah. You know? so, Boy, oh man, that movie is so good. Um, it is. <laughs> uh, yeah, I watched Coded about eh, like a year ago, maybe a little more, and it had been a while since I'd seen it, and I had forgotten, like, this movie just rocks. Like, I'm glad it, it has a more orchestral kind of score, but if it was just ripping guitars all the way through it, that'd be fine too. Yeah, Basil Paladoris. Uh, yeah. Sure. Oh, it's so good. Anyway, uh, all right, let, let's move to phase three of this thing, which is uh, themes of the film. This is a scenario where I don't think that it, there's anything too deep here. It kind of touches on that Frankenstein kind of thing of like, you shouldn't play God, you shouldn't tamper with Mother Nature because you can create unstoppable Wolverines that will come after you and murder everyone you love. Yeah. Uh, also, maybe as a footnote, don't use crazy people in experiments. Maybe that's also not a great put, idea. Also, don't put dogs in, in freezers. Yeah, that's a big one. You know, there's a, a weird recurring theme uh, so far on the listener request month. We did White God last week and, uh, and, and did a 
you know, story by Stephen First about animal abuse in this one. So, uh, just, uh, you know, welcome to dog abuse February, apparently, here on the Dark Parade. <laughs> Um, Which I'm not laughing at dog abuse, but... <laughs> sure. Yeah, no, it's yeah. not where I want it to be, ladies and jelly spoons. This is not what I wanted. Um, anyway. Uh, uh, if somebody just picked white dog, then you were fucked. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, so let's do final thoughts and let's let's rate this thing. Um, you, you do this first, because I think you're probably going to be kinder to it than I will be, and... Uh, I'll, I'll end on a sour note. Yeah, uh, there's some faults with this movie for sure. Especially with some of, like, the edited in styles and, you know, the way that the story's told. They could have gotten to, like, John Kirby just killing motherfuckers a little bit quicker, in my opinion. They could have cut, honestly, they could have just fucking cut the whole bar fight scene out and that would have been, like, fucking ten minutes there. You know? But, uh, you know, some of the romance shit. You know, not my favorite Chuck Norris movie, but not the worst either. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, I like a lot of the supporting cast in this. That keeps me interested enough to keep going. Uh, there's some interesting choices. And then when John Kirby's actually fucking murder mofos, that's when the movie really picks up for me. So it does have some ups and downs with the film, especially on rewatch for me. But overall, you know, it reminds me of that first experience when I first saw Hot Fuzz. So it's kind of nostalgic in that sense, too. Where this movie taught me, I learned from another movie and it taught me about other movies because I learned about Brian Libby and his Darabont connection. <laughs> yeah. In that sense, you know, so I still have some, you know, it's just, I have history with this movie from the first time I've seen it. And, you know, it, it kind of holds stronger for me for that. But, yeah, I'll give it like a three out of five. You know, that it's a mid average to, you know, I like it, but there's some faults with it, you know? Sure. Yeah. Uh, all right. So three out of five is where you land on this guy? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, that's respectable. Um, yeah. I mean, I, this is re repeating some of what I've said, but yeah, I just feel like it takes so long to get to the stuff that makes this movie interesting. Um, it takes too long to regenerate uh, or, or bring <laughs> back to life. It. Yeah, I, like it, it, it takes too long to get to the Frankenstein monster part of this. Like the opening scene I think is real fun. I think the scene with him killing Ron Silver and, and his family is real fun. Um, and kind of from there like the end is okay like once you get into the final fight and that big fight in the bar is kind of fun just because it's well choreographed and there are some good stunts and stuff but it just doesn't hang together real well like I said the tone kind of beers all over the place none of the characters are anybody that you can really get behind other than Chuck Norris who again is just not necessarily a great enough actor and not a charismatic enough screen presence like you know, like Stallone, like Schwarzenegger, like, you know, those kind of top tier action stars, or even Bruce Willis, like Bruce Willis has kind of a swagger. Um, and, and Chuck Norris just has great karate moves. And so yeah. it's, it, I, at any rate, at the end of the day, I would give this movie like a solid two out of five, mostly because of the look on Ron Silver's face after he's been killed. That is haunting. And I will dream of it uh, frequently uh, for, from yeah. now until the end of my days because it, it is such a gruesome look. But, yeah, it's it's not a movie. Like, unless you're just a Chuck Norris completionist or a fan of, you know, kung fu meets horror, I would still say, like, eh, watch Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires. That's a better example. Uh, and some, some good Shaw Brothers stuff as opposed to something like this. But... It's it's got its moments. It's interesting. I I just wish it were about twenty minutes shorter. I think. Yeah, I think that would help the movie a lot too. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, let's get to our our final moments here on uh, on the dark parade. 
And uh, let's do the three things that you may not know about the film Silent Rage. Um, at one point, Derek, uh, the guy who played Leatherface, Gunnar Hansen, was going mm. to be John Kirby. And Toby Hooper was considered as the director. But uh, that obviously fell through and we did not get Toby Hooper's Silent Rage, which I think would have been a million times better movie. If they didn't offer him enough cocaine, that's the problem, probably. If, you're probably right. He was like, I'm going to need at least an, an alligator's worth of cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like, how about a chihuahua? And he was like, I ain't doing it for anything I'm, else. I'm Imagine if he just brings the alligator puppet from fucking eating alive right. to fill the fill the cocaine to the meeting. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, I need you to fill this up because I'm running low. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, but sadly, that did not happen. Um, number two on our list of things you may not know about Silent Rage. It is one of two movies that uh, director Michael Michael Miller produced in 1982. Uh, the other movie was National Lampoon's Class Reunion, which also featured Stephen First. Oh, yeah, that's like their, the, the spoof slasher. That's right. Also featured a murder. So, Michael Miller who claims that he was not a big fan of slashers, did both a slasher parody and a slasher karate movie in the same year. That's crazy. I didn't even know that. Yeah. See? That's what this show is for. Uh, and finally, something that you did not know about uh, this movie, this was the first movie produced by Topkick Productions, which was the uh, production company Chuck Norris started, and it's the first time that he ever had complete control of uh, of his movie. Um, uh -huh. Being the, the guy who held the purse strings. Uh, and he would all, like, the same company, uh, he would do Lone Wolf McQuaid and also produce Walker, Texas Ranger from uh, his production house. So uh, certainly successful uh, financially. Uh, you can argue the artistic su success of the output of Top Kick Productions, but, uh, you know, good for him. I guess. And yeah. I don't know that this is the last time that Chuck Norris will appear uh, here on the Dark Parade. Um, but it's probably going to be a while. Yeah, I see a lot of more Chuck Norris in your future for pick six movies. Yeah, I think that is the venue for Chuck Norris. Um, well, I'm glad I had this conversation with you about Silent Rage. Oh, for sure. Like, it, it was a lot of fun... It was a lot of fun to talk about this movie, but it's not, a, again, just not a movie I'm going to go back and watch again anytime soon. I Like, I like a, a good schlocky movie, but there's just not enough schlock in this schlocky movie. Yeah, for it to because be great. some of it's trying to be serious. Yeah. I get you. I get you. I'm, I feel like that with certain movies myself. You know, like, if it, if it embraced the, like, the absurdity of its premise, I, I would be more down for it. But, uh, at any rate, um, Derek, look, I, uh, thank you for recommending it, even though I've, I've, I've been, uh, teasing it some, um, what, uh, where can people find more out of you though? Cause I know, uh, they're going to want to, and, sure. uh, where, where can they find more, more stuff about Chuck Norris, more stuff about people being brought back from the dead, all of that stuff. Uh, you can find most of my content. I'm the main host of Cinema Attack. You can find that on Anchor.fm. Uh, pretty much the most way to find where our shows are posted is just to join the Cinema Attack Facebook group. Uh, we were just not talking about just any... Oh, we talk about all types of movies, dear. But, uh, yeah, we haven't recorded in a while, so we're going to try to get a show out this month. Uh, just been hectic with life stuff. You know how that goes. Mm. But, uh... Then on uh, No More Room in Hell, you can find on the Dark Discussions Network. Uh, we just recorded an episode of this recording. It's not out released yet. should be released soon. But uh, by the time that actually this is released, it should be released, to be fair. But yeah, that's, look for that. Uh, Creature Comforts, we just, uh, recorded an episode on Terrence Fisher's Island of Terror. That should be out by the time this is out. So yeah, like I said, look for that. 
Uh, honestly, that's about it. All right, that right seems now. like enough. That seems like enough. Um, all right, man. As always, I really appreciate you doing this. We'll uh, we'll get together soon for yet another movie. And uh, as for the rest of you knuckleheads listening to this, I'll be right back uh, to close out the show. And there you have it. That is Silent Rage. Uh, thanks again to Derek. Uh, you can find the show notes over on legionpodcast.com uh, where you can find links to all of the stuff that Derek is doing. And uh, he does a lot of fun stuff, so I encourage that you do so. Uh, finally, um, we've got a lot of stuff happening around here on uh, on the Dark Parade. Uh, in addition to uh, these episodes and a found footage fool coming up, uh, we also have What You Watching with Jamie and Bo coming up this month, as well as uh, The Heart of Horror with Kate Pollock, a special birthday episode. Not my birthday, her birthday. And uh, so you're going to want to join us for that one. I guarantee that that one is going to be a good time. We haven't even recorded it yet, and I can tell you that that one's going to be a good time. The conversation we've had about recording that has been fun. So uh, we've got other stuff on the way. There's some more uh, listener requests. And I really appreciate everybody listening. Uh, you know, again, we continue to kind of grow month over month. And, and it's because you guys are doing my bidding when I request that you, you know, you review the show and you share the show around and that kind of thing. So uh, it, it is working. The plan is working, everyone. Good job. Uh, my minions have, have served me well. But I, I love doing the show. I'm excited at, at what comes next. And thanks so much for, for being along for all of it. Uh, enough out of me. Uh, thanks again for listening. Thanks for rating, reviewing, liking, sharing, all that fun stuff. And uh, we will see you next time on The Dark Parade. Talk to you then. <laughs>